Brian. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a wishful thinking. Right. Motion on sanctions. I call Minister Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I beg to move that the Committee has considered the sanctions, EU exit, miscellaneous amendments and revocations, Regulations 2024. In recent years, the UK has transformed its use of sanctions. We have deployed sanctions in innovative and impactful ways, including in our response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have taken a rigorous approach, Mr Speaker, carefully targeted to deter and disrupt malign behaviour and to demonstrate our defence of international norms. This statutory instrument covers several measures which will strengthen our sanctions regimes across the board and allow us to uh, continue the work already being implemented across government. So, if I may, I will run uh, through each measure within this SI in turn. Firstly, uh, director disqualifications. Uh, In October 2023, the government added a new type of sanction to the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act 2018, director disqualification sanctions. This instrument uses that power to amend the UK's autonomous sanctions regime, which will mean the government can apply it to individuals designated under these regimes. It will be an offence for a designated person subject to this new measure to act as a director of a company or take part in the management, formation or promotion of a company. This will further prevent those sanctions from deriving benefit from the UK economy. It is an important addition to the UK sanctions toolkit. This instrument provides ministers with the flexibility to apply the new measure on a case-by-case basis. The government will ensure that the measure is targeted and operates alongside the UK's full suite of sanctions powers. This instrument also enables the government to issue licences to persons to allow them to undertake activity that is otherwise prohibited. The FCDO has been working closely with the Department for Business and Trade, Companies House and the Insolvency Service on the implementation of this measure. Um, Mr Speaker, HM, with this us, I will also clarify the sanctions enforcement remit of His Majesty's Revenue and Customs, HMRC. HMRC has well-established responsibilities for enforcing trade sanctions in its ability as the UK Customs Authority. In recent years, however, the scope of trade sanctions has evolved beyond import and export prohibitions to include matters which are outside HMRC's customs remit, such as sanctions on standalone services. Last December, the Government announced the decision to establish the Office for Trade Sanctions Implementation, OTSI, uh, within the Department for Business and Trade in order to enforce these new types of measures under the civil law. Once it starts operating, OTSI will also be able to refer serious offences to HMRC for criminal enforcement consideration. HMRC will continue to have both civil and criminal enforcement responsibility for sanctions within its customs remit. This legislation is needed to clarify the sanctions measures for which HMRC is solely responsible for enforcing and those which it will investigate on referral from OTSI or another civil enforcement organisation. Yes, of course. Can I thank my right friend okay. on that point? This is an issue, uh, the sanctioning of the shadow fleet, that has been of great importance to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and so can I thank the government for bringing forward this really important legislation today? And actually on that point, Mr Speaker, can I thank you for your support of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, during this Parliament? Um, and can I also take the opportunity to put on record my thanks to what is an incredible committee what has been an incredible honour to chair, and particularly my clerk, Chris Shaw, who is truly incredible, uh, as well as the rest of the committee who have been wonderful. Um, Can I also put on record on behalf of the committee our thanks to the government for all you have done in Ukraine, for showing the leadership that has meant that Ukraine is still standing and fighting. But on that point, can my right and friend just confirm that actually this is not just about tackling money and the profits that are going into the Russian coffers, but also violations of maritime law. And that is why today's sanctions are so very important and why the government is showing yet again we will always stand by Ukraine. Um, I thank my uh, honourable friend for her uh, intervention and indeed uh, for her Uh, very kind words towards uh, all those uh, who do the huge amount of work behind the scenes to enable us to bring forward what has been a rolling uh, level of sanctions legislation, uh, which has, as she says, continued to uh, degrade uh, Putin's ability to fund his war. Uh, We believe that sanctions across the peace have taken out something like £400 out of his uh, capabilities. Uh, It's a continuum, which is why uh, this 
uh, piece of legislation today continues uh, to do that. But uh, she is absolutely right. The sanctions will continue uh, to be tools that help us uh, keep ahead of uh, the many ways in which uh, those who would wish us harm, those who wish to uh, support uh, Putin in his illegal war in Ukraine, uh, continue to be hunted down and to restrict their capacity to do so. Yes, of course. Well, uh, she and I have worked on uh, various things over the years, um, but could I ask her, uh, those of us who, in this House on all sides who are passionate about sanctions are still extremely worried about certain significant people in this country. Indeed, a recent uh, 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 article in the Times suggested a, a hereditary peer in the House of Lords is a main channel of Russian money, not only to uh, uh, help certain political factions in this country, but in the United States. Isn't it about time that we did something about the upper house, which seems to have a small group of pro-Putin members? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman uh, has, as he says, been an incredible champion and supporter of uh, all the work uh, that we have been doing in a very cross-party way to keep uh, ahead of the sanctions. Uh, as I always say, and I know it's frustrating, please, where people have evidence of any sort where there are uh, those they consider are uh, supportive or enabling of uh, Putin or his uh, regime or indeed any military activity, the teams uh, in the FCDO look day in, day out uh, on being able to bring forward a package of evidence that we know would withstand uh, judicial review. So uh, we stand ready. I will never comment on what we're taking in and what might come uh, next, but uh, the teams are working flat out to look at the evidence wherever they can. So that is a continuum, and I say that not only to members of this House, Mr Speaker, but much more widely to those who are um, out on the front line or indeed uh, working with businesses where they see uh, areas where they believe uh, that is happening. They should bring the information to us. Yes, of course. Uh, except some evidence that I have about the Earl of Asquith at Oxford that is, I think should be urgently considered by all of us careful and worried about sanctions. If the Honourable Gentleman would like to uh, write to me uh, later today, I will make sure that the team uh, look at the information he provides as soon as possible. Can I, can I, can I just say, uh, I know it's his, <laughs> his final day, but we still have rules of the House about being critical of members of another House, so if we can still use that caution even on his last day in the House. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this legislation is needed in order to clarify the sanction measures for which HMRC is solely responsible for enforcing and those which will investigate on referral from OTSI, um, and it will therefore establish a consistent approach to the enforcement of trade sanctions. This legislation will facilitate HMRC and OTSI working in close partnership so that they can robustly enforce all trade sanctions against Russia and indeed other target countries using civil and criminal powers. Uh, Mr Speaker, on the financial sanctions side, this SI also includes new obligations for persons designated under the Belarus regime to report any assets they own, hold or control in the UK or worldwide as a UK person to the relevant authorities. The measure is another step in improving the transparency of assets owned, held or controlled in the UK by designated persons and will strengthen the ability of HM Treasury's Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation OFSI, uh, to implement and enforce UK financial sanctions. Importantly, the measure will act as a dual verification by enabling the comparison of disclosures by designated persons against existing reporting requirements that bite on firms such as financial institutions. Under the new requirement, the government will be able to penalise those who make deliberate attempts to conceal assets to escape the effects of sanctions. An equivalent reporting obligation was placed on designated persons under the Russia regime in December 2023. Therefore, the extension of this requirement to Belarus also ensures alignment between the Russia and Belarus regimes, something which is particularly vital given the frequent overlap of the Belarus and Russia sanctions regimes and the cooperation between the two states in relation to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mr Speaker, we have also included several sanctions on Belarus on the export of so-called battlefield goods. These are goods such as electronic equipment, integrated circuits, as well as firearms and aerospace technology. These new measures also prohibit the import of Belarusian aluminium into the UK, both the metal itself and aluminium products. Aluminium products are a sector of strategic importance to Belarus and have been their top export to the UK. So although the UK nexus with the Belarusian economy is limited, the signalling impact of our sanctions on Belarus is and will remain important. 
We keep these sanctions under constant review and, of course, we reserve the right to introduce further measures so that the Lukashenko regime continues to feel the consequences for its lack of respect for human rights and for its support for Putin's war. Uh, Mr Speaker, finally, we are also revoking the Burundi sanctions regime. This will remove an empty regime from the statute books. The decision in 2019 not to transpose into UK law designations under the original 2015 EU sanctions regime reflected the improved political situation in Burundi. We do not have the same level of concern about the widespread political violence in Burundi that led to the original decision to impose this regime, so have made no designations under it. As we set out in the recent UK sanctions strategy, the Government keeps our regimes under review and responds to changing circumstances. We are committed to lifting a regime, a specific measure or revoking a designation when their original objective is no longer served by their continuance. So, Mr Speaker, to conclude, sanctions continue to play an important part in the UK, continuing to build upon its already impressive sanctions capability. In the years since the landmark Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2018, our approach to sanctions has evolved considerably to respond to the changes in the world, and we will continue to work on sanctions to meet any new challenges. I commend these regulations to the Committee. The question is, as on the order paper, Shadow Minister Catherine West. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and could I echo your comments in relation to both Deputy Speakers, who sadly are stepping down uh, at this snap general election. And I'd also like to thank the Minister for setting out the regulations for the House today and her general cross-party working and uh, her encouragement that both the Security Minister and also the Treasury get involved when looking at these sanctions because it does take a cross-government approach and also echo her comments about the excellent work that the uh, officials have done at the OFSI. Labour supports the necessary and common sense steps being taken in this instrument today and we will not seek to divide the House on this issue, although it might have been nice to have done it last week rather than this morning, just from the point of view of one's nerves. Um, <laughs> we've been consistent as a party in supporting the government in expanding the UK sanction regime as it relates to a variety of countries, but in particular in relation to Russia since the unlawful and barbaric invasion of Ukraine. We've also been candid and honest where we think the ministers are not going far enough or have acted too slowly in holding global actors to account or where there are considerable loopholes present in our regimes which they continue to exploit. We've made clear that when it comes to the integrity of our sanctions regime, Labour would work assiduously with partners and allies to counter the plethora of threats posed by actors across the world, ensure proper enforcement and finally bring about the seizure of Russian state assets for the purpose of supporting Ukrainian reconstruction. Before moving to the substance of today's measures, I would like to raise a more general issue with the Minister which my Honourable Friend the Shadow Europe Minister, Member for uh, Cardiff South and Penarth, has brought attention to on several occasions. On the issue of the enforcement of monetary penalties for breaches to the UK sanctioned regime off sea website, shows that there's only been one penalty issued in relation to the Russia regime since the start of the war in Ukraine. And I wonder if she could elucidate in her summing up whether that's just the website being out of date or whether that is um, another, there's another reason for that. that. This seems quite woeful. And can the minister therefore tell the House whether this is the case? And can she account for why enforce the enforcement rate, for example, in relation to the USA is so low? I hope the Minister can provide clarity in this area. Moving to the substance of the measures being considered today, Labour supports these measures, preventing a designated person from being a director of a company or overseeing the promotion, formation of management of companies, a necessary step to take to dismantle the ecosystem of illicit finance, which designated persons skirt sanctions and retain access to their wealth. I would like to ask the Minister for some clarity on a point. We know there have been concerns raised from all sides of the House regarding the issuing of licences which grant designated persons dispensation to become exempt from a given provision. Can the Minister clarify whether there will be ministerial oversight over the granting of these licences and whether the Treasury, the FCDO and the DBT will be working in lockstep to ensure cohesion and coordination when it comes to the granting of those licences? We saw last year when revelations came to light regarding a licence issued to none other than Yevgeny Prigogin, follow, allowing him to sue a UK journalist, the implications of what can happen when the issuing of these licences is done without proper scrutiny. So I hope that the Minister can provide clarity on their granting as it relates to today's measures. 
Moving on, we also support the measures related to HMRC's mandate and, in terms of the Belarus, a new reporting obligation for persons designated under the asset freeze to disclose the value and nature of any funds or economic resources they own, hold or control in the UK. We also support the prohibition of the export from the UK of items critical to Russian weapon systems and its military development in addition to certain aerospace goods the prohibition of Belarusian aluminium imports and a ban on the provision of ancillary services. On these prohibitions, can the Minister account for why it's taken so long for these measures to be brought in? It seems unconscionable that well over two years since the onset of the war in Ukraine, and not forgetting that the Belarusian concerns of this House were raised in advance of the invasion of Ukraine, UK items which could be used in Russian weaponry are making their way via Belarus to the front lines, potentially aiding and abetting Russia's war effort against the people of Ukraine. We understand that any sanctions regime is indeed a work in progress, but we cannot continue to countenance UK exports filtering through to Putin and the cronies who facilitate his war machine, especially given the situation in and around Kharkiv at present. In closing, Mr Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for setting out the, the measures today, though, as I say, they could have come earlier, and I hope that she can provide clarity on the concerns I've raised. Labour will continue to support further expansions to our sanctions regime, but it's becoming ever clearer that the actions that we take today will have an impact with lasting ramifications, and that in devising them in the next Parliament, we hope to strive to be even bolder, swifter and more ambitious. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We now come to a maiden speech, the member for Blackpool South. I call Chris Webb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, when it was announced that I was the winner of the Blackpool South by-election at 5.15am on the 3rd of May, I called on the Prime Minister to hold a general election <laughs> and give the rest of the country the same chance my constituents had to vote for change and elect a new Labour government. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for taking me up on that, although I hadn't expected to be back out on the campaign trail quite so soon. But I asked the whole House to join me in sending our solidarity to my amazing wife, Portia, and now I'm suffering yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 my side throughout with our amazing three-month-year-old son, Killian, who has brought so much joy and laughter to our lives. Yeah. I'm grateful, Mr Speaker, for this opportunity to stand before you at short notice and at the last opportunity before a general election. Had I not, I would have risked a lifetime of being an answer to an obscure public question. <laughs> <laughs> but I relish getting back on the doorstep speaking with fellow residents. I'd like to thank my predecessor, Scott Benton, and his staff for all their work and support of local residents. And I'd also like to thank Gordon Marsden yeah, yeah. for his yeah, personal yeah, support yeah, yeah. and tireless work in Blackpool South during his 22 years of service. Yeah, yeah. Gordon is still fondly remembered and recognised for his huge contribution to my constituency and his pursuit for everyone having access to lifelong learning. Yeah. I wouldn't be here today without two teachers who inspired and supported me as a young student with undiagnosed dyslexia. They helped me get to Hull University and on the road to this chamber. Stephen Conway, Kenwin Stanley, I thank you. And I would like to pay a special tribute to Anne Hoyer, a Labour giant on the Fylde coast we sadly lost last week. The first Blackpool constituency was created in 1885, a decade after the opening of the railway had begun to bring an influx of visitors to our town. In 1945, a separate Blackpool South constituency was created. It became clear it had an identity of its own. It's home to the famous Pleasure Beach, Blackpool Tower and Three Piers. It has beaches with golden sands and, as locals will argue, the best ice cream you'll find anywhere at Notriani's, <laughs> serving tourists and locals since 1928. I am a child of tourism. My mum, having moved to Blackpool to become a redcoat in the 80s, but I'm also a child of public service. My dad, a Blackpool postie, who wanted to help and support fellow workers in Royal Mail and then in BT and others throughout the CWU. Yeah. And my mum, who, thanks to the last Labour government, was able to retrain for free and become an early years teaching assistant yeah, yeah. at my primary school 
following her dream job. Before then, my paternal nan, Val Harmon, was a scout leader who dedicated her life to inspiring young people. My maternal grandfather, Brian Harmon, who was a local independent councillor and who, it's still, at 83 years old, is heavily involved in his local community centre in Burntwood. My paternal grandfather, Dougie Webb, who served in World War II, fighting fascism in Europe and Africa, and once guarded Winston Churchill at Chequers, all of them public servants. But it was whilst tracing my paternal grandmother's history that I was amazed to find out how deep my family roots go in public service. I discovered that my 14th great-grandfather, Edward Moondy, saved the life of Henry VIII. The king was out hunting with his hawk when he tried to reach over a ditch with a pole that broke. Edmund Moody was a footman of the king who leapt into the water and saved him from drowning. Sadly, the six pound a year pension he received and the land as a reward didn't stretch far enough to help his ancestor, my nan, Margaret Webb, who had a tough life growing up in Liverpool. I wasn't raised on stories of brave footmen who saved kings, but of those of my nan and her sisters who wore newspapers for shoes and how they battled TB during wartime without an NHS. Through grit, determination and welfare reforms of a progressive Labour government, my nan and granddad were able to move into one of the first council houses built in Blackpool in the 50s in Grange Park and she went on to run her own small business in Blackpool's famous Amendon Street Market. Having grown up without proper health care, she knew the value of our NHS and how vital it is that we protect it and I will make it my mission in this, in this place to do so in her memory. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Since the pandemic, Blackpool has seen record numbers of visitors rightly returning to our beloved seaside town, which has so much to offer. But whilst tourism recovery is central to our town's future, it's now time to focus on recovery of our communities beyond the prong two. But after years of austerity and now with the cost of living crisis, all too often the town I'm proud to call home is recognised at being the sharp end of statistics in poverty, crime, mental health, life expectancy and more. I will work tirelessly for them, hopefully in the next parliament, and I hope to prove them right that politics has the power to change people's lives. Yeah. 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 My heartfelt thanks goes to the people of Blackpool South who have put their trust in me on the 2nd of May and elected me as their Blackpool born and bred member of parliament. My hometown's motto is progress. The town that pioneered municipal street lighting, electric tramways, modern tourism for the working classes, has continued to forge ahead even in the deep spending cuts. Now with a Labour MP, and hopefully under an imminent Labour government, Mr Speaker, I will fight to make sure progress is possible for everyone in Blackpool, inspiring the next generation. With economic stability, families in Blackpool South, where a third of children live in poverty, won't have to choose between heating and eating. Cuts to NHS waiting times will mean in Blackpool South, where people are twice as likely to die as heart disease by the age of 75, than people in wealthy areas will be able to see a doctor when they need to. Hundreds more police on the streets will mean that in Blackpool, where weapon and knife offences have increased by more than 400% since 2015, safety will be restored to our communities. But these painful statistics only tell half the story. Anyone from Blackpool will tell you to look behind the headlines and beyond the bright lights of the illuminations to find the real story of our town. It's one that is alive with grassroots creativity, culture and a thriving LGBTQ plus community and a wealth of fascinating lives that could only have been lived in Blackpool. It's one of community resilience and people who, who with very little are always willing to give someone else who has less. There is a wealth of community organisations and charities working hard to improve the lives in Blackpool South. For their dedication to the town, I'd like to thank Council in the Community and its ins inspirational founder, Stuart Hutton Brown, Blackpool Food Bank, File Coast Women's Aid, We Came Blackpool, School of Street, Blackpool Street Angels, Boat Health Youth, the Friends of Stanley Park and St Peter's Church Soup Kitchen and many others too numerous to mention. In closing, Mr Speaker, I wouldn't be standing here today without the support of our good friend and my mentor, Tony Lloyd. Tony was an incredible Northern Labour parliamentarian who we sadly lost at the start of this year. 
For me, politics is all about people, Tony once told me. It's that sense of human solidarity that matters. If it's not ma about making people's lives better, don't be a politician. I'm sad that he isn't here to see me take my seat, but I, I will honour Tony's memory by serving my constituents in the same way he served his, with people at the heart of my politics. Yeah. 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 James Heapy. Uh, Mr Speaker, thank you very much indeed, and I rise to speak very briefly uh, on sanctions. But before I do so, I congratulate uh, the new member for Blackpool South on an excellent maiden speech. Um, it is my privilege to give my final speech uh, on the back of such a brilliant first speech. And whilst I'm sure that those in Conservative central office will have other ideas, I hope that it's the first of many speeches he gives in this house. Um, Mr Speaker, this place matters in terms of the way that the UK competes uh, with our adversaries and those who challenge us all around the world. It's not just what the government does through the FCDO and through our embassies and through other government departments. It's important that Parliament shows its resolve. And as any colleague in the House will know who has had the pleasure of travelling to do the government's business overseas, we are routinely beaten up by ministers in foreign countries for things that are said on these benches. Um, and therefore, the resolve of the House to support the government of the day in making sure that our foreign policy is supported and has resolute support on these Greece benches is enormously important. And the way that we do that is not just through the employment of our military, uh, which it's been my great pleasure to work with over the last four years, but also through the way that we pull all of the levers of government in order to achieve effect through both hard and soft power all around the world. And so these at the very back end of this Parliament are important measures, and it's right that they are being put through uh, with, with cross-party consensus today. Um, now, Mr Speaker, my personal circumstances mean that I can't be here later today, so if you'll indulge, I'm just going to say one or two uh, very, very quick thank yous uh, as I draw my parliamentary account to a close. Um, and the first, uh, as I segue from... Uh, the strategic and the international uh, is to thank all of those ministerial colleagues with whom I've had the pleasure of serving over the last four years uh, as we have gone through an incredible period of challenge to our nation. Um, there are many uh, who I have served alongside who have made me a better person for uh, their expertise and for all that they've been able to talk me, but none more than my right honourable friend for Preston and Wild Forest. Who, um, to work alongside him in some of the darkest moments that our nation has faced in generations during the pandemic, during the Kabul airlift, during the invasion of Ukraine, uh, will stick with me as one of the proudest uh, times of my life. Uh, and it was a great honour to serve alongside you, um, Secretary of State. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my partner, my family, my friends, particularly my children, Charlie and Tilly, for all of their love and support over the last nine years. I'd like to thank my staff, uh, those in my constituency office and up here in Westminster. I'd like to thank the Wales Conservative, the Wales Conservative Association for all their support and kindness. I'd like to thank my constituents for sending me here, whether they voted me, voted me or not. Representing them has been a huge privilege. But, Mr Speaker, as you know well, our public discourse is changing for the worse, and there's a toxicity to it now that means that it requires real bravery to come and sit on these benches. You, Mr Speaker, have been a great protector of this House and those who have the courage to sit on these green benches and speak up for their opinions, speak up for their constituencies, and to try and make a difference for the positive uh, for those that they represent and for our country at large. Um, Mr Speaker, um, thank you for your leadership and guidance over this very difficult Parliament. Thank you for all of your support uh, and for the occasional bollocking when I've gone on too long <laughs> at the dispatch box. Um, thank, you, thank you to all colleagues on all sides of the House. When we have disagreed, it has always been with courtesy and with respect and I think that 
not enough people beyond this place see that that is the way that the affairs of this House are mostly conducted. But, Mr Speaker, most of all, to those who arrive here in July, um, returned to represent their communities and to make a difference on behalf of this country in what will be incredibly challenging times, I, leave, I wish them, and particularly my successor in the new seat of Wells and Mendip Hills, all good fortune and success. It's been a great pleasure to serve here, sir. A real honour. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sad day. Can I come to SNP spokesperson Kirsty Blackman? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I'd like to congratulate the member for Blackpool South on his uh, maiden speech. Normally, he would stand up and say, I'm sure he will be a doughty campaigner for his constituents, and I'm sure he will for a week. Um, and I, you know, I, I, do, I do wish him all the best and hope that he is returned uh, to this place. Um, I also want to send best wishes to his son and to his wife, Portia. Being a spouse of a politician is probably the worst job in the world. Um, it is incredibly difficult, and I cannot imagine the roller coaster that she has been through in the past um, few weeks. So I send my solidarity to her as well, particularly as she is um, dealing with the joys um, and otherwise of having a very young child uh, to look after. So congratulations to him. Um, if, if you don't mind, Mr Speaker, I want to do just a few short thank yous. I will probably be speaking on the Tribunal's uh, bill later on, um, but I think probably now would be a more appropriate time, given the mood of the House. Um, I'd like to thank um, a few of my colleagues who are no longer uh, going to remain in this place post the election. Firstly, the member for uh, Glasgow North, who during my time as Deputy Leader was the Chief Whip for the SNP. He was my confidant and my rock. Um, we had many late night sessions planning parliamentary mischief, um, not least in advance of the SNP walkout that, that um, I think a number of people will remember very well. Um, and I appreciate everything that he did for me during that time. I'd like to thank the member for Glenn Rothis, uh, who is probably not someone that will be remembered as um, uh, uh, somebody that has set the uh, heather on fire in this place but has done absolutely everything that has needed to be done, has done everything that has been asked of him, and has dealt with some incredibly technical legislation, and has always been there with words of advice whenever they've been needed. Um, I'd like to thank the member for Dundee East, who has been in this place for a long time, um, who is going to be stepping back from uh, frontline politics, but I'm sure not from the SNP. Um, he has similarly been a huge source of advice and although we've had some very good natured disagreements um, I have a huge amount of respect for everything that he has done particularly for the SNP as a whole and I have no doubt that he will carry on doing that and on a very very personal one the member from Paisley and Renfrewshire South who has been one of my closest friends in this place, whose departure I have not quite reconciled myself with, um, and I'm not sure I will ever get over, um, who I will miss incredibly um, uh, after, we, uh, after I intend to come back to this place, and she doesn't. Um, so I will, I will miss her a huge amount. Um, moving on to the, this specific debate in the um, sanctions regime, um, uh, just, just on that, uh, the member, member for Glasgow Central is not here today, but has done a huge amount of work that I'm sure members across the House will recognise, particularly when it comes to things like beneficial ownership and Scottish limited partnerships. Um, the, there are concerns that we have in relation to sanctions. I think this legislation is a good step in terms of closing some of the loopholes that we have had concerns about, um, closing some of the loopholes that some of my friends and colleagues have been raising. Um, I, I would like to raise the fact that Scottish Limited Partnerships um, in 2022, there were the number of Scottish Limited Partnerships that were started was something in the region of 1,300, only four of which were started by Scots. Um, so although we have been campaigners on Scottish Limited Partnerships and we have massive concerns still about the Scottish Limited Partnership regime and the fact that it is 
used for money laundering um, in significant uh, numbers and significant concerns about that. Um, we want to say that although it's called that, it's technically nothing to do with Scotland, which is why we need Westminster to take action on it. Um, it would be great if whoever is in the next government could crack down on the abuses that there are in Scottish limited partnerships. Uh, we're pleased in the, some of the action that's been taken around beneficial ownership, but we don't think that we are there yet um, with all that we need to ensure that actually sanctions regimes and all of that are applied appropriately. If you don't know who actually owns something, it is very difficult to say that they can't own it. Um, in terms of the com company's house issues that we've mentioned before, there is progress being made on that, but again, my colleague from, from Glasgow Central would make clear that things have not gone far or fast enough in the reform of companies' house, and again, that's around transparency. The Minister very much stressed transparency when she was speaking um, around the sanctions regime, and I am pleased with any moves that improve transparency. We very clearly will not be opposing this um, SI today. I think it is a good thing, but there is still more to be done to ensure that sanctions regimes work appropriately, to ensure that those people who should not be able to have directorships or ownerships or um, basically money launder or make money um, through the UK because we have designated those pe people to be um, responsible for or aiding war crimes um, or um, uh, human rights uh, abuses, um, there is more to do to ensure that that transparency is increased so that those people um, can be cracked down on. Um, just lastly on sanctions, um, we are still concerned that there has been too, too slow to move to increase the number of individuals who are being sanctioned. Um, there, there are other jurisdictions which have significantly higher numbers of individuals who have been sanctioned, um, particularly when it comes to uh, areas like Russia. Um, the, there is more that could be done to ensure that, and, and I do appreciate the number of statements and the number of actions that the UK government has taken, particularly around Ukraine, and the hard work that has been done to support the people of Ukraine, and I know that that is appreciated by people and the government uh, there, but I th still think there is more that could be done um, to ensure that this place is saying to Russia, your actions are inappropriate and we are going to hit you where it hurts financially um, with increasing the number of individuals who are, who are sanctioned, who are subject to those, um, to those um, financial penalties and the inability to um, move money or, or have companies in uh, these islands. So I'd like to thank the Minister for bringing this forward today and make clear that we are absolutely supportive um, of the SI and we are looking forward to post-election there being significantly more work to tighten those loopholes and to increase the number of individuals who are subject to sanction. The question is as on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. I think the ayes have it, the ayes.